Pokemon. It's a game held close to many people's dear hearts. Whether it be the blissful remembrance of simple, long-gone times, or the progression of the player's journey being reflected in themselves. But one core aspect in Pokemon that adds to its longevity is the almost endless sea of different moves, each with their own effect. However, just like an overfilled box of Pokemon cards, there are some bound to be lost in time, forever stuck at the bottom of the ocean, to adorn themselves in dust. And that's what I want to focus on in this video. This is part 3 of a series where I discuss Pokemon's most forgotten moves, as well as some cool facts. So if you like this video, make sure to check the others out. With that being said, let's take a stroll through Pokemon's abandoned basement. If there's one thing that I've noticed throughout my search for forgotten Pokemon moves, it's that a lot of older ones aged horribly in battle. Whether they're too weak, have poor accuracy, or just not stand out enough, they've been overshadowed by much better ones. I think this first move is decently known, but it's one that has literally been lost to time. Say hello to what might be the most underwhelming fighting type move ever, Rolling Kick. If you've used a Hitmontop before, you've probably seen it, but ended up ditching it with a sour taste in your mouth. Why? Well, while it has a chance to flinch, its base power of only 60 is pretty mediocre. However, not only that, it for some reason has an 85% accuracy. And that's probably why it's been left to rot, despite being in the game since day one, where it was still just as bad since the only Pokemon that could learn it, Hitmonlee, got access to better fighting type moves almost immediately after. In fact, after over 25 years, this is the entire list of Pokemon that could ever learn Rolling Kick. I think Game Freak even recognized how outdated it became seeing how it's been removed in every game since Sword and Shield. Signature moves are pretty hit or miss. Some are really great, while others almost seem to be made intentionally bad for no reason. This next move is a signature move that unfortunately falls into the latter group. Octazooka. Before Generation 8, it was only learnable by one Pokemon, Octillery, which is already not the most popular Pokemon, and even once Sword and Shield came out, it was only given to Grabloct, who does not need this move at all. But even though it has a very limited learn list, why is it still so forgotten? Well, to start things off, it only has 65 power, which is underwhelming given the somewhat high level needed to learn it. But to make things worse, just like Rolling Kick, it has an 85% accuracy. I know that it has a pretty high chance to lower accuracy, but that doesn't make up for it being so unreliable. And to top it all off, if you want to catch a Remorade in Gold and Silver, you need to travel to Johto's Ocean Routes. And what do you need for that? Surf. Yeah, talk about horrible game design. I honestly wouldn't even care about the accuracy if its power was raised to something like 120, but strangely, despite being introduced all the way back in Gen 2, in the 25 years since, it's never gotten a single buff let alone a single change made to it. So, I think similar to Rolling Kick, Game Freak just kinda gave up on it. When we think of Pokemon moves, we often tend to think of ones in the main series games. But for a moment, let's think outside of that bubble and look at the moves locked to the outside. There are a lot, and I mean a lot, of them that have never made an appearance in a single main game. Which ones am I talking about? Well, obviously the TCG ones with some of the most creative names including Tenter Tentacles, Boyfriends, and Everyone Explode Now. Yeah, imagine those being in a main series game. But there's one other avenue I'd like to look at that people often forget the spin-off games, more specifically, the Mystery Dungeon games. Most people going through a casual playthrough will assume that the games incorporate all of the moves present at the time, and that's true. They do include every single move, but also a little more. You see, there are two attacking moves that can only be found in these, and only these games, them being Wide Slash and Vacuum Cut. Vacuum Cut is just a move that deals a set amount of damage like Sonic Boom, but Wide Slash is the one that's much more interesting, because along with Vacuum Cut, it's one of the only moves to have the question mark type. But the most fascinating part about this is the fact that because White Slash deals regular damage, it is the only regular attacking move in Pokemon history to legitimately be typeless. This next one is actually going to consist of several moves that all kind of fit into the same category. With every generation of Pokemon, there are numerous time-sensitive events that give out free Pokemon, usually with unique features. 
Because of how short of a time frame you have to collect these Pokemon, many of the older ones have been forever lost to history. However, in Generation 6, Game Break decided to take this exclusivity a step further by also giving a select few event Pokemon scattered across the world one of four secret event moves. Those being Celebrate, Hold Hands, Happy Hour, and Hold Back. And to make them even more exclusive, you couldn't pass them on to other Pokemon. This essentially meant that, if you weren't at that place at that time, your chances of obtaining a Pokemon with one of the event moves was incredibly slim. Unfortunately, even if you were to snag one, you wouldn't be met with much of a reward. That's because none of them are actually anything useful. The first three don't do anything, and the last, Hold Back, is just a reskinned False Swipe. They did get a tiny bit of prominence in Gen 7 with their Z-Move effect boosting all of your stats, but since Z-Moves are probably forever a thing of the past, they've fallen back to complete obscurity, only in the possession of the most devoted collectors. Among the over 900 different Pokemon moves, there is a category of attacking moves that can never miss, such as Swift and Shockwave. A lot of these moves have a base power of 60, but if I were to ask you which of these moves has the highest possible base power, excluding Z moves, what would you say? Maybe something like Aura Sphere given its AD base power? Or if you're thinking even further, Thunder and Blizzard in their respective weather conditions? But surprisingly, the answer to this question is one of the least used and most forgotten moves in Pokemon history. That being Trump card. It's a normal type move introduced in Generation 4 that has the interesting gimmick of being stronger the less PP it has, with its last use having a tremendous 200 base power. Unfortunately, it's fallen into complete obscurity for two reasons. Firstly, like many other forgotten moves, it's learned by very few Pokemon. More specifically, only four Pokemon have ever been able to learn it by level up. And secondly, it's just not a great move. While a 200 power may seem appealing, for the first four uses, it's dead weak, only going to a decent AD base power on the second to last use. So if you've never seen it in game, well, I wouldn't blame you, because neither have I. Which is probably because not only can very few Pokemon learn it, but the levels they learn it at are also absurdly high. It was definitely a neat little concept, but unfortunately, this is a case where the idea far exceeds its practicality. An interesting coincidence among many of these moves is that they were removed in Generation 8, which was the first time existing moves were excluded. But interestingly, there exist three moves in Pokemon history that were actually removed from the game even earlier. The first is the most well-known, being Light of Ruin, a fairy-type move that is exclusive to Floet's Eternal Flower form, but this Pokemon was never distributed, so it was never officially released. However, the other two are what I want to focus on more. Remember how I talked about Mystery Dungeon's exclusive moves? Well, there are actually two others that I didn't mention for the sole reason that they aren't legitimately obtainable in the game. The moves Excavate and White Slash are only obtainable through TM. However, this TM doesn't actually exist normally in the game, nor can any Pokemon learn the move using the TM, effectively rendering them deleted. However, the strangest part about this fact is that the moves for some reason have translated names, but only in some countries, whereas in other countries, the names were just deleted. I feel like like these two moves are strong contenders for the most forgotten moves of all time, seeing as they only ever existed in two Pokemon spin-off games, and not even legitimately. This makes these the first Pokemon moves to ever have been removed in any game. When thinking about the hardest Pokemon moves to obtain in a playthrough, most would probably think of late game moves such as Thunderbolt or Flamethrower or even further, signature moves locked to mythical Pokemon. But in my opinion, none of them come even close to what I think may be the most painfully difficult move to obtain in a single player playthrough. It's not a super rare TM, it's not a move tutor move, nor is it even a good move. It's the signature move of Regigigas, Crush Grip. But to understand what makes this move so difficult to obtain and even see, we need to talk about how absurdly tedious it is to get its sole learner. Because, oh my god, getting this thing is a journey. If you wanted to get a Regigigas at its introduction in Gen 4, you needed to first own a Gen 3 cartridge and then play the entire main story up to the final gym, or until you can use Dive outside of battle. But that's not all. You also have to have three specific things prepared before you can start your expedition. A Pokemon that knows Dig, a Relicanth, and a Waylord. 
who themselves aren't easy Pokemon to obtain. Then, you need to surf to Route 134, which is a completely optional route in the story, and dive at a very easy to miss spot. You then have to follow a few specific instructions conveniently written in braille, such as arranging the Relicanth and Waylord in a certain fashion in your team, and then finally you can catch the three legendary Regis scattered across Hoenn, which is no easy task. But even after all of that, you're just halfway through your journey. You'll then need to boot up your Gen 4 game and complete the entire main story, transfer the three Regis using the Pal Park, and then, and only then, can you access Regigigas in Snowpoint City. But the final step to obtaining Crush Grip is either the easiest or worst part depending on which game you're playing. You see, Regigigas doesn't even learn Crush Grip until level 75, but thankfully in Diamond and Pearl, it's at a very nice level 70 when you first encounter it. But in Platinum, it is so, so much worse. Because, for whatever reason, Game Freak decided to make it a level 1 encounter, meaning that you'd need to spend 74 levels grinding it up, just to get a move that isn't even worth it due to its hindering ability. Initially, I didn't think that Crush Grip was that rare of a move, but after doing this research, I I'm kind of realizing that it's absurd just how much Game Freak expected you to do to obtain these legendary Pokemon. I'm not sure if that's considered putting a lot of effort into the game or just having players beat around the bush, but I'd like to think that some unfortunate kid back in 2008 with no access to any events or any guidebooks at all managed to do all of this, put all of this work in legitimately, and somehow fit the pieces together just to finally obtain what could only be seen by the most dedicated players, or I guess the filthiest cheaters. And whoever that kid is, big props to you.